Hello, this is Chuck Ridgway, Automation Technology Manager here at Horner. Thank you for joining us for another Tuesday live stream, the first Tuesday live stream of 2022. And joining me today uh, for our topic, let me talk about the topic first. Today, we're going to take a look back at the live streams and the webinars that we produced for you in 2021. And joining me today is Mr. Nate Beachy, subbing in for Mr. Casey Gardner. How you doing, Nate? I'm good, Chuck. How about yourself? I'm doing terrific. You know, uh, earlier or late last year, as I was going through and counting all the live streams, I'm thinking, you know, I was confident we had done one in every single week. And I went back and counted, and I only came up with 51. It turns out that January 5th of 2021, I guess I was slacking off. There was no live stream on that Tuesday. Kind of ruined it for me. But um, really, since the pandemic has happened, we've all had to adjust and provide a lot more online content, a lot more video content, because you know you never know when another you know surge is going to happen, and people just need their information. So, what's one of the ways that uh, you know all this online content has kind of impacted you? Uh, well, first off, you're getting a good start this year. It's the first Tuesday of the year, so uh, there's that. Um, for me, I guess at least uh, Horner-wise, we did our first virtual training session here for Horner. Uh, that turned out pretty well, despite some technical glitches, like my computer completely crashing on me. So other than that, um, it's been a somewhat normal and not normal year at the same time, I guess, for the most part. There you go. And from a training standpoint, we have multiple training courses coming up in the first quarter of this year. So that's something we should probably also cover. January, we've got an in-person training course, you know, if everything situation-wise is willing. Mm -hmm. February, we have an in-person advanced training. And then in March, we have, I believe, another online training session. So if things kind of go crazy with the session. Omicron and, and uh, some of the attendees have to cancel, uh, keep in mind, we do have online training available in March. Okay, right. so Nate's going to be manning the chat today, um, and as usual, Marcy is going to be in the background keeping things on the rails. If you have any questions, go ahead and chat those in, and Nate will either answer those directly or save them until the end. If you're watching this on replay, we still want your questions. Just go ahead and put them in through the comment section, and we'll get those answered in a timely fashion. Okay, let's go ahead and dive in. So today is our live stream review of 2021. So we're going to start off by talking about, you know, what were our goals for 2021, you know, as we entered last year and why did we decide to go with the live stream format? We're also going to take a look back at the live stream videos that we produced last year. And this is going to include both the 51 live streams on Tuesday, as well as a few of the customer webinars that we held last year as well. We're going to take a look at the videos we produced, which categories were they in, which ones were the most popular, you know, how did we do in terms of views, were people, you know, taking a look at the content, and we'll also take a look from a YouTube standpoint and how we did from a subscriber standpoint. Uh, that's another good uh, metric as well. And then we're going to have a little bit of fun towards the end, and we're going to take a quick look at how we produce the live stream to give you a little look behind the scenes because, you know, let's face it, most of us watching this are techies and we're interested in technical things. And of course, producing a live stream is fairly technical. And then at the end, I also wanna make sure that we give credit where credit is due for sure because there's a lot of folks behind the scenes that have supported us in this effort all year long from, from 2021. Let's go ahead and dive right in. So what, are, what were the goals, I should say, for 2021? Well, if we take a look back at 2020, of course, that was the year of the start of the pandemic and also really the year of the webinar for most companies. You know, more people than ever before were working from home and consuming a lot of online content, both training wise, as well as, uh, you know, for meetings and everything else. And so there was a huge demand for training material and online webinar type material. And so in a typical year pre-pandemic at Horner, we would, would have maybe four or five webinars per year. And during 2020, we produced more than 20 of them. So that was a huge increase for us. Attendance was really also very high. Our webinars had always been well attended, but during the 
early part of the pandemic, it was just crazy high. And then of course it trailed off as more people were able to venture outside of their office. Now, when we were doing those webinars in 2020, we were using a webinar only production software called GoToWebinar, it's a good software package, but a little bit limited in the type of production things that you could do with it. So it was primarily the format of a slideshow with narration. So as we got ready to start 2021, we set several goals, both as a company in terms of what we wanted to accomplish in terms of training our customers, as also in terms of the kind of production qualities in the videos that we were producing. So certainly we wanted to continue to grow our library of video content. You know, the 20 videos or so that we created in 2020 were well received and were available for people to rewatch or to watch, you know, uh, after the fact. And so they were very valuable. And a lot of the material that we created in 2020 was educational in that we would cover general purpose automation topics that weren't necessarily highly commercial towards Horner products. Of course, we produced some commercial content as well, but there was a lot of educational content in there, and that was also well received. In 2021, we wanted to continue some of those educational type videos, as well as use video in general to expand our customer base. And there was one other key goal we had for 2021, and that is we were putting a huge emphasis in terms of engineering and in terms of just promoting to our customers the need for them to start adapting and getting comfortable with variable-based programming in Seascape. Keep in mind, most PLC and other automation companies that have been around as long as Horner had kind of forced their customers to switch away from register-based programming several years ago. We didn't take that approach. We basically said, you can continue to use register-based programming or you can start using variable-based programming as we add that to Seascape. And what we were finding is the transition was happening very slowly. So we put a lot of emphasis in 2020 and 2021, especially towards getting customers more comfortable. So that was a primary goal that we had for sure. So from a production standpoint, we also wanted to expand beyond the, the webinar format. So we didn't just want to do slideshows with narration. We wanted to be able to provide more demonstrations, more product demonstrations, more software demonstrations, more hands-on content in general. And also in general, we wanted to increase the production values up a notch or so. And we wanted to continue to interact with customers, but do it in a little bit of a more modern way. So we selected for 2021, we said, hey, let's kind of switch over. Let's still do webinars, of course, but let's take a look at switching over to more of a live stream type format. So why did we do that? Well, live stream is a fast growing format, especially among yes, younger consumers. And not all automation engineers are in their 50s like I am. We got a lot of younger folks out there, the next generation's coming, and we need to adapt to their desires. Live streams are also more flexible in their production capabilities, especially for live demos. It's a lot easier to do live camera demonstrations and those sort of things in a live stream production environment than it is in a purely webinar environment. Webinars are really limited in terms of their video quality. They're pretty much stuck at the, at the webcam approach. And then in the live stream format, we think that we don't really give, an, give anything up technically over the webinar format. We still get the interaction with customers and it's a little less formal, which I think is uh, attractive to a lot of folks. And this is a really important point. Live stream production allows perfection to not get in the way of developing content. Let me tell you what I mean here. When you're producing a pre-recorded video, you want it to be perfect. You want the narration to be perfect. You want the video to be perfect. You want everything to be perfect. So you end up spending a lot of time with every single detail and it can really delay you in terms of getting content to the market. So we still wanna produce highly professional content that's as good as possible, but our live stream content at, le at least, we don't let perfection get in the way of developing the content. So in terms of picking a platform for live streams, well, we chose YouTube and another platform called Big Marker. And why did we do that? Well, of course, when it comes to getting information or looking for information and help online, customers automatically start with Google. 
and they'll typically end up on YouTube. Now, of course, they'll also start out on manufacturers' websites, so we make sure that we have a, a good website for people to find the information they're looking for, but a lot of folks just start out on Google and they end up on YouTube. Video is the format that most users prefer these days, you know, when they're looking to do anything for the first time or looking to learn on a new subject. And YouTube has also become a really a destination for consumers, whether it's, uh, you know, checking out content on their free time or, or professionally trying to get more information. Now, the one thing that YouTube doesn't do, though, from a corporate standpoint, is it really doesn't provide like registration and a lot of kind of the the information that we like to get as a company about our customers. So we chose Big Marker as a platform for webinars and also for our live streams because it gave the advantages of a traditional webinar tool, but also allowed us to simultaneously stream to YouTube for those customers who just prefer to get their content that way. So we've got really both the best of both worlds at this point. Okay, let's take a look back at the videos that we produced in 2021. And there were 56 of them. Uh, we had 48 of them that were live on Tuesdays with our standard live streams, okay? We had another three Tuesday live streams that we actually pre-recorded. I went on vacation in October, I had a business trip in October, and it was just becoming difficult to produce it from the road, so we said, to heck with it, we'll just pre-record those three. So of the 51 we did on Tuesdays, 48 of them were live. And then we also produced five webinars for customers throughout the year. We also did some sales channel only type webinars for our sales channel, but from a customer standpoint, we did five of them. Again, four of them, four of them that were live and one that I pre-recorded while I was uh, not exactly on the beach, but while I was on vacation and then we showed it um, on a Tuesday while I was out of the office. So those were the number of videos that we produced last year and there were 56 of those. Okay, let's take a look at the different categories in which we produce these videos. So uh, there, of the 56 videos, 10 were on hardware topics, you know, things like the introduction of the X10, uh, micro OCS X10 controller, introduction of the IO simulator tool, and, and other type uh, webinars that, or I'm sorry, live streams and webinars that were hardware related. We had 11 that were on communications. Now, during 2020, we did a lot of communications related type educational webinars because that's what people were really looking for. But we continued on with communications and did 11, 11 of them this year. HMI related type topics, you know, things like uh, data logging or alarming and those sorts of HMI related topics, adding images to your OCS screens, those sorts of things. We had 14 of those. And then ones that were programming related primarily, you know, different function blocks in Seascape, different languages in Seascape, tag-based programming in Seascape. We had 20 of those. Again, we're trying to really emphasize to customers the advantages of a variable-based or tag-based programming environment. So we really put an emphasis on that. And now in terms of views by category. So of these different categories of videos, how were the views? Which ones did people watch the most? And really what we found was the most popular ones, they were all popular and all worthwhile for sure. But as you can see, the most popular ones were related to programming as well as communications. And what you find, especially with communications, there's just a lot of people who aren't necessarily Horner users that are looking for more information on some of the communications topics that we presented on during the last 18 months or so. So that helps drive the communications number up there as well. And then hardware and HMI, you can see at 2991 and 1958 respectively. So lots of good views of the videos that we produced over the last 18 months. If we take a look at the average views per category. So in other words, some categories we had more videos. So if you do the math, you wanna see the average views per, per video. Again, now this time, because we didn't do as many uh, communications videos, you can see that the actual views per video are the most popular for, for communications with programming not too far behind. Okay, so what were the most popular videos in 2021? Well, intro to Seascape tag-based programming. 
I, that makes me very happy because remember, one of our primary goals of 2021 was really to promote to customers and get them comfortable in variable-based programming in Seascape. And our number one video for 2021 in terms of views, the most popular one, was on that very subject. So that's a wonderful thing as far as Horner's concerned. Uh, it was a topic that was important to us and our customers thought it was important as well. Another one that was really valuable was getting started with Horner OCS. And that one, as you could see from the title, was really geared towards new users of our product. And as a manufacturer, we always want to grow our customer base. So, and it, that was a goal of 2021 in general at Horner, and of course, a goal uh, from the video group in terms of supporting that. So, uh, that was our second most popular video in 2021. Another hot topic was, you know, and has been for some time, is the industrial internet of things, right? Industry 4.0, as it's often called. And MQTT is a hot topic when it comes to the industrial internet of things. We did some very popular videos back in 2020 on that topic. And in 2021, we really focused on hands-on with that MQTT IIoT protocol. And as you can see, that was a very popular video. One that kind of snuck out of nowhere for me, and that is serial port operation. There are a ton of views on serial ports. And in that video, we talked about things like interfacing with barcode readers and anything else you might do with through a serial port on an OCS. And it's, I guess, not shouldn't be too surprising because in the industrial world, there's still a lot of serial-based devices out there and probably a little bit of a shortage of information online as to how to work with them. So I think we provided a good service there to our customers and to others by covering that topic this year. And then, of course, a topic that's really important for existing Horner users is going to be firmware updates. How do you do firmware updates on the Horner OCS? And so any existing user is going to, at some point, need to upgrade the firmware on their unit. And, you know, that video was obviously popular and that reflected that need. Okay, so those were the most popular videos in 2021. While we're on the topic, let's just sneak back another year and see what was the most popular in 2020. Okay, so going back a few months to the videos that were released before 2021 started, these were the ones that were the most popular. And you can see the top three are all general information, uh, detailed information, but general information on three industrial ethernet protocols. BACnet IP, which stands for Building Automation and Control. Ethernet IP, which is a very popular industrial Ethernet protocol that's kind of driven by the ODVA. Uh, it's the most common protocol you'll find with Rockwell equipment, of course, as well. And then Modbus TCP Communications, which is the de facto standard industrial protocol for interfacing devices from multiple manufacturers. So those three were incredibly popular this year, even though they were produced in 2020. A couple others to talk about. PID control. We did a very detailed dive into PID control, both as it's applied in our products, as well as theoretically how it works, what are the benefits of it. We spent a lot of time on tuning and on tuning strategies, if you will, and practical tuning hints and those sorts of things. So that's definitely a video I recommend you go back and revisit. There's a lot of good information in that one, and it's been very popular. And then when we introduced Seascape 9.9 .9 Service Pack 3, that was the very first version where we really emphasized variable-based or tag-based programming in Seascape. So we put a lot of emphasis on that, and people responded by watching that video as well, which in, among other things, covers the variable-based programming in Seascape. Okay, so those were our most popular videos in both 2021 and 2020. Okay, so some other things I thought I would mention while we're on the topic today, live stream views in 2021. Now, we're not talking about, you know, our tech support team releases tech tip videos and quick help videos that are you know nice and compact and short in duration those get a lot of views and really rightfully so but the numbers i'm showing you here in terms of the live stream views don't include any of those videos that's really just the views for the videos i've been talking about with our live stream format and also the ones we produced at the end of 2020 and we've had nearly 18,000 views of those which is really encouraging so people are really 
checking out the content, whether they're watching it live or not, they're checking out the content um, after the fact even. So that's a good thing. And then our number of subscribers has increased by 78%, which is terrific. So that's showing us that people value the information we're sending out there and they're subscribing so that they can get notifications and those sorts of things. So that's also a great thing to see. Okay, next, I thought I would talk a little bit about kind of a fun topic. We're all techies, right? I mean, if we're automation engineers in general, we probably really like technical things. So let's talk a little bit about and take a little peek behind the screen at how we produce our live streams. I thought that would be a fun topic to cover with you today. So let me go ahead and turn off picture in picture here. Okay, let's start by taking a look at kind of how the signal flows or how this kind of goes with this kind of summary slide here. So if you couldn't tell from kind of watching the production over the last year or so, if you couldn't tell, we're actually in two different locations. So Nate, and usually it's Casey, but Nate has sit in for us a couple of times, but Casey and Nate are located typically at the Horner headquarters training room. So we've got a small studio there that we use, it's right in the training room, and we use it not only for these Tuesday live streams, we also use it when we're doing pre-recorded videos for tech support, we also use it for online training, those sorts of things. So it's a kind of a multi-purpose studio, if you will. And what's happening there, of course, is that's where Casey or Nate are located, and I'm talking to them on camera and that video feed with the audio embedded in it is sent over the internet to a Horner remote, remote studio where I'm at and that's sent using a protocol called RTMP. So it's a kind of compressed high-speed video transmission protocol. Typically, you know, when done right, you can get a lag of less than a second and that's typically what we see here in our connection between the headquarters training room and the studio I'm in here. But what that does is, if you'll notice from the arrow, that's a one-way connection. So the video and the audio from Casey or Nate is only going from headquarters to me. They can't hear the other direction. That's a one-way feed. So in order for everybody involved in the production to talk to each other, we have what's called a back channel, which is an audio only channel that doesn't go out over the air that we use typically Teams for. So we have a, you know, on Nate's laptop and in addition to Nate or Casey, we have Marcy who's also involved. She's our marketing guru. She's also involved in monitoring the broadcast, setting everything up in advance, a whole bunch of things. And then she's also online in the background on that back channel, keeping an eye on things. So that's how we communicate with each other. That's over a back channel. And that's done with typically with Teams. Although we've used Zoom in the past, we've used other tools as well. So then that video feed goes from the headquarters to my studio location here, which is basically my basement. And effectively, I take the video feed over RTMP and it comes in as an input to, to my system here. And then I'll mix in the demos, the slides, my audio, all those other things. And then the output from my studio is also an RTMP stream, but this one with all the content in it. And this one goes directly to Big Marker. So they've got a, a server, we log into their server and we send that stream to Big Marker. And then Big Marker then simultaneously forwards that stream on to YouTube. So that's how the stream actually gets to YouTube. So that's how the signal flow works from the Horner training room to my location here, over to Big Marker and then through to YouTube. Now. After the live broadcast is done, YouTube and Big Marker record it for us. And we also do local recordings where we can. And then what Marcy will do in post-production is she'll actually take the recording of the live stream and she'll tighten it up and edit it by editing. Okay, so she'll get rid of my 16,000 ums that I end up, you know, spewing all over the broadcast. She'll also tighten things up where we can. And occasionally, if we really have a technical glitch, we'll re-record parts of it. And she'll include that in the edited version. And then she'll upload the edited version, usually a day or two after the broadcast, back up to YouTube. So that's, that's what she does. And that's a lot of work in post-production. And hopefully the better we do live, the less post-production work has to be done. Let's take a closer look at the equipment that's in our training room in the headquarters. So what we've got there is we have a device, the main real device there is something called an ATEM. 
And that's a device that's used for switching the video and the audio, you know, which would typically be for our live streams, that's typically going to be Nate or Casey's video feed, the face on camera for that, as well as the audio. And we have a front camera that we use for our live streams all the time. And then we also have an overhead camera that Nate really uses heavily when he's doing uh, his online training, because that's how Nate does all his product demonstrations for training is he uses that overhead camera that's part of that headquarters setup. And then we've got a boom microphone you can see there in the picture that's used typically for voiceover or, or the live voice. And then we also have lavalier microphones that are wireless that are really handy. And I think that's primarily what Casey and Nate have been using lately are those lavalier microphones. And then in addition to that, we've got a couple different monitors. Now the monitor there in the center that you can see, the smaller one there, that's what's called a multi view production monitor. That's the monitor that uh, shows the current state of all the different sources. It shows the levels for audio. It shows how the recording's going, how the streaming's going, all that in, in one view, if you will. And then there's a second monitor and a docking station. That's where Nate or Casey will dock in their laptop and then they'll use their laptop for doing demonstrations or for monitoring the stream or whatever the case may be. So that's what's going on at the Horner Headquarters training room. Now, in my setup here, there's actually a little bit more equipment going on here because I'm actually adding in more sources than what we have from headquarters. So I also have an ATEM at my location here, but it's a little bit more of a sophisticated one. And you can see in the picture there, it's got a few more buttons and a few more inputs and outputs than what we've got at headquarters. So that one actually has the capability of up to eight cameras and up to multiple microphones. It also has the capability of doing a lot of graphics and, and the multi-views and those sorts of things. So it's an ATEM, it's just a little bit more sophisticated. I also am using something called a Stream Deck. And that's a device that it's over to the right of the ATEM in that photo. And it's just, a, I think it's 24 buttons. It's a deck that has 24 buttons on it that has kind of macros or one touch push buttons that allow me to change scenes or allow me to add graphics or those sorts of things without trying to find the tiny little button that's on the ATEM. I also have an audio mixer that's on the far right there that's used for my microphone and also to kind of give me a monitor for the back channel that we're doing. And then, of course, we have multiple cameras here. I've got a front camera, just like Casey and Nate use. Now, at the very top there, you can't really see the camera, but you see a tiny little monitor. That's actually a teleprompter, but I don't use the teleprompter for reading from a script or anything like that. I just have a little seven inch monitor that's, I guess, shining back at me that shows me what's going out over the air. And then behind the teleprompter is that head on camera. So I can look right into the camera. And basically while I'm doing that, I can see Nate, I can see Casey, and I'm looking right at him as we're talking. It just makes, makes it a lot easier for me for sure. So that's kind of one of the monitors that I use. And then for my sound, I've got a boom microphone. I should probably switch over to a lavalier. I haven't done that yet. And then a couple more pieces of electronics I should mention. We have what's called a streaming bridge. That's the actual piece of electronics that is an RTMP input. So that's what the signal from Horner headquarters is coming in over. That's that RTMP input. And then that's coming in as an input to my ATEM. And then I'm actually using a Raspberry Pi in a very specific purpose arrangement to simulate or to emulate what's called an, a hyperdeck. Now, a hyperdeck is a very sophisticated, very expensive, very reliable video player slash recorder that's used in production. Uh, you know, I don't need that. I just need a way of playing our intro video and our outro video in a, in a reliable fashion. So we're using a Raspberry Pi and a piece of software called Playout B to emulate a hyperdeck so that we can do that video playback as another video source. And then I've got a total, in addition to that seven inch monitor that's connected to the top there that I've already talked about, I've also got three other monitors. I've got a dedicated Seascape monitor on the left I have my own multi-view monitor in the center to monitor all the sources. 
and I have a monitor on the right that's dedicated to a Mac Mini. Now on the left, that Seascape monitor, that's dedicated to an Intel NUC. So anything Windows related, including Seascape, I demonstrate using that Intel computer. And then the Mac Mini I just use for the slideshow and a few other miscellaneous things relating to the, the Stream Deck and that sort of thing. Okay, so there's two computers and four monitors in the system as well. So there's a lot more going on than you might imagine there would be. Okay, now that I've kind of talked about the equipment here at my location, let me see if we can show it to you. I've got a third camera connected. See if I can bring that in. Okay, there we go. So you're looking at more or less what I'm looking at here. Well, I've described most of this equipment in detail. I'll just quickly go through it again. There's the teleprompter up there. There's my Seascape monitor, my multi-view monitor that shows me all the sources. Over here is my Mac mini monitor. You know, we're doing a variety of different things, including the slides. Okay, let's take a look at everything else. This is the ATEM I talked about. That's the main switcher. This is just a general purpose keyboard that I can switch on the fly between the Intel computer and the Mac computer that I'm using as part of the production. I'm using two different mice here. I don't have a single mice to switch between, although I could, I suppose. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the other equipment as well. So down here, this is where I have those computers. So there's the Mac mini, there's the Intel Windows 10 NUC. I also have a Apple TV. Why would I need an Apple TV? Well, that's just used so that if I'm demonstrating, for instance, the Horner iOS app on a tablet or on an iPhone, I can go ahead and screen mirror to that Apple TV, which then is a, a video source for the ATEM. So that's what that's used for. On another shelf that you can't really see down there, that's where we have that streaming bridge that's used to bring in the RTMP video from headquarters. This is that Raspberry Pi down here next to that that's being used to simulate or emulate a HyperDeck for video playback for the video intro and the outro. And then I've also got, you know, I've got a, a power switching lineup here where I can turn on and off, you know, various uh, sources and lights and those sorts of things. Of course, I've got my microphone up here on the right. This is that Stream Deck I was talking about. Really, it's just a series of of shortcut buttons that I can use to switch screens and those sorts of things. Here's the audio mixer, which I don't really have to adjust during the show at all. It's pre-adjusted. I pretty much just set that and leave it alone. And um, so that's the equipment. Now, what I did from a mounting standpoint is I decided to look for a desk that I could customize. So I just went to Ikea. They have cheap enough desks that I felt comfortable in custom modifying. All the monitors you see here, and including also the teleprompter, that's all mounted to permanent mounts. Um, and those mounts aren't just clamped on the desk, they're actually mounted permanently to the desk. So I've got three desk mounts there for the monitors and for the teleprompter. I have also have a whole variety of different holes drilled in the uh, desktop with grommets, so cables can go down through. And there's a wire tray you know, underneath the desk where there's tons of cabling there, trying to keep that out of the way. Also, another modification I made is I permanently hard mounted a 19 inch rack, a desktop mount 19 inch rack that's three slots high. That's all mounted here. So that has permanently mounted shelves uh, for those components I've already talked about. In the back where you can't see, there's a vertically mounted 2U rack, which has an ethernet switch mounted in there because a lot of this gear, the computers, et cetera, those all require ethernet connections. So I have a dedicated ethernet switch for this desk. So that's some of the customizations I've made to the desk. Now, the best part of the customization though, you can't really see from this view. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the overhead view and this is a view much more zoomed out than you would normally see of my demo desk. So this is my demo desk that's located left of where I'm sitting when I'm facing the camera. And it, as you can see, I've customized it with a piece of DIN rail. You know, most of our products are DIN rail mounted or can be DIN rail mounted for demo purposes. 
I've drilled a bunch of small grommets in the desktop for IO wiring and network wiring, as well as power wiring. In a typical demo, I'll have an OCS mounted here. I'll have our IO simulator mounted here. I've also got a dedicated 24 volt supply, uh, power switch, and distribution terminals over here. So this demo location with an overhead camera is great for demoing our product. So that's really my favorite modification to this desk probably of everything. Okay, well, thanks for taking a look behind the scenes. So the last thing I want to do before, well, let's just go ahead and bring, let's go ahead and bring Nate back in here. So let me go ahead and there we go. There's Nate. So Nate, um, did you follow all that kind of behind the scenes stuff on the, uh, all the connections and all that? I pretty much did because I'm kind of a gadget freak like that also and I was just gonna say anybody who knows Chuck knows that the gadget freakery uh, is pretty good so his little uh, teleprompter device there I had to look straight at the camera which means I can't see my screens and so if I'm looking at the screens I'm off to the side and it doesn't look good on the actual video here so things like that are what uh, Chuck pays attention to those little detail like that which makes the production quite nice yeah and I'm um, you know one of the things I typically do is I'll I'll try different things. I mean, things have really evolved over the past 12 or 14 months in terms of what equipment we use and how we hook connect it and that sort of thing. So we're always trying out new things and trying to make things more reliable, less, less reliance on computers, more reliance on dedicated hardware so that we don't have, you know, like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had my Mac mini just reset in the middle of the production. Thankfully, we weren't streaming from that Mac Mini or else the production would have gone down completely. Now, there was a little bit of a glitch. There was about a 15 second glitch while we lost some capability, but it was just a 15 second glitch. We didn't lose the whole thing uh, altogether. So um, again, we're always trying to make it more reliable and I'll try things out here at this studio. And if they work really well, then we'll try and incorporate them back at headquarters as well. Did we get any questions yes. today by chance? I did not get any questions today. Okay, I didn't think we would. This is kind of a fun look back at uh, 2021 and a little peek behind the scenes. So um, uh, yeah, I didn't really expect a whole, lot of, a whole lot of questions today. One more thing that's important for me to cover, and thanks, Nate, for filling in for Casey, and we'll see you Not soon. Uh, one more uh -huh. thing I wanted to make sure I covered was I need to give credit where credit is due. All of last year and even before then, there's all kinds of people continuously in the background that are supporting us technically so that we can provide accurate content to you on our Tuesday live streams and our webinars. And all these people you see on the screen here have helped in numerous ways in ensuring our content is accurate, and helping me figure out things when I'm uh, maybe saving something to the last minute and I run into a, a glitch in pre-production or something. But I've gotten tremendous help from all these folks. Also, I don't want to leave out all that Marcy does in the background, getting everything ready every week, getting a lot of these slides created. And also, I want to mention uh, Phil Horner, who has been very supportive. You know, he's obviously one of our owners and he's been very supportive in helping us get this uh, uh, video content delivered to you, the customer. Once again, I want to mention, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. We bring you content every single Tuesday and it's two o'clock Eastern time. Currently we're not on Eastern, we're not on daylight savings time. So it's two o'clock Eastern daylight time. You can watch live on YouTube or actually watch on replay as well. And don't forget, you can watch live on Big Marker as well, if you'd prefer that platform. Also, you'll see an email, I believe, Thursday that will announce a variety of things. It's our normal monthly Horner newsletter. You'll see all the announcements for the specifics on our January live events. And then what we will be covering next week, we'll go ahead and announce that now, next week on Tuesday, we'll be taking a look ahead at, a, uh, we'll be doing a preview, a Horner preview for 2022. So we looked backwards today, we're gonna look forwards next week from a product standpoint, as well as from a production standpoint. So hopefully you'll join us for that. Once again, uh, I wanna remind you to stay safe out there. You know, the number of cases are bumping up again, but 
luckily a lot of them are mild. So if we all do our due diligence, we should be able to stay safe. So for those of you who can join me next week, we look forward to seeing you again on Tuesday.